Hello Ice and Fire Nerds, this is Chris and welcome back to another Game of Thrones foreshadowing video. Let's pick up right where we left off with Season 1, Episode 8, The Pointy Hand. Dracarys. Alright, so let's jump right in and now we have a scene with Sam and the Night's Watch. You may be a coward, Charlie, but you're not stupid. Get them inside. So, Jor Mormont tells Sam he may be a coward, and later on, of course, we see this. And he also had told him he's not stupid, and no, he's not, because later on, we see this. So he kills a White Walker, proving that he's not a coward when he needs to step up, and of course later on he goes to the Citadel because he is not stupid and he's going to become a wizard, and probably help figure out the end of this damn thing. Also during the same scene we see this. Any sign of Benjen or the rest of his party? Just these two, my lord. Been dead a while, I'd say. So of course specifically they were talking about Benjen in this scene, and these were the two that were with Benjen when he disappeared. And of course, later on, they would become whites. So this is the first people that we know that turn to whites. We, of course, did see whites in the very first episode. But they were specifically referring to Benjen here and how these dead men should be stinking of rot. And later on, we see this. So basically this kind of gave us a hint that Benjen was in fact going to be a white in some way, shape, or form, but of course he ended up being Cold Hands, which is a very mysterious character in the book who George R. R. Martin says is not Benjen Stark, but that's yet to be seen. Either way, he has become a white, but yet he's the only character that's kind of maintained his sense of humanity, and he's still fighting for the living. And in our next scene, we see this between Jor Mormont and Jon. My sisters were in King's Landing too. I'm sure they'll be uh, treated gently. So he says here that John's sisters will probably be treated gently, but later on we see this. Leave her face. I like her pretty. So no, unfortunately, Jor Mormont was wrong. They didn't get treated gently at all. They both got their asses kicked. And in our next scene, we see Kat receive the news of Ned, and she rushes in to talk to Lysa. Does family mean nothing to you? Family means everything to me. And I will not risk Robin's life to get caught up in another of your husband's wars. Now, Lysa specifically mentions here that she won't send the Knights of the Veil to rush off to another one of your husband's wars. So basically, this is a reference to something that was mentioned in the show, and that is Robert's Rebellion, of course, what happened when Robert took the Iron Throne. And then of course we have the Greyjoy Rebellion, which took place about six years after Robert's Rebellion, and that's when Theon was captured and taken back to Winterfell as Ned Stark's ward. But during this scene, we also hear Lysa tell Catelyn this. The Knights of the Vale will stay in the Vale where they belong to protect their lord. So Lysa says specifically that she will not send the Knights of the Vale to fight in another war, but later on, of course, in Season 6, we see this. And in our next scene, we see Tyrion and Bronn strolling through the woods. Fair enough. But don't go looking for me to bend the knee and the Lord you every time you take a shit. I'm not your toady, and I'm not your friend. Though I would treasure your friendship, mainly interested in your facility with murder. And Bronn did prove to be a trustworthy companion over the years, but when it was time for Tyrion to have another trial by combat, we saw this. Why should I risk it? 
Because you're my friend. Aye, I'm your friend. And when have you ever risked your life for me? I like you. Pampered little shit that you are. I just like myself more. So he doesn't fight for him because he really doesn't want to go up against the mountain. But the point being here that once Bronn got settled in with some gold and got a little title, he no longer wanted to defend Tyrion because he was already set. But you really can't blame him. And in our next scene, we see Bronn and Tyrion come up against the mountain clans. The lords of the Vale want me dead. I believe it is time for new lords of the Vale. So Tyrion specifically references here, perhaps it's time for new Lords of the Vale, and later on, we see this. <laughs> so technically, although we have the same Lord of the Vale being Little Robin, really it's Littlefinger, and maybe in Season 7 we'll see somebody else take that spot. And then of course we see Tyrion talk a little shit to Shaga, son of Dolph. Those are the best weapons you could steal? Good enough for killing sheep. If the sheep don't fight back, Lannister Smith's shit better steal. So Tyrion gets smacked up in the damn face with an axe and gets his first little battle scar, but later on we'd see this. And next we have a scene at Castle Black between Jon Snow and Alistair Thorne. Stop putting down! Blood will always tell. So he goes to go John into trying to attack him, but specifically Alistair Thorne says, Blood will always tell. And I guess he's right because later on, as far as Jon Snow's concerned, we see this. And near the end of this little conversation or skirmish, you could say, we hear Alistair Thorne say this. You'll hang for this, busted. So he tells John he will hang for this, but later on we see this. You would, Sir Alistair. I fought. I lost. Now I rest. And in our next scene, we go over to Essos, where Danny is experiencing the full might of the Kalasar. Jorah, make them stop. So this is where Danny begins her understanding of slavery and her becoming an abolitionist. But what's really interesting here is they are doing this for gold so they can buy ships to sail across the narrow sea and give Danny the Iron Throne. But in a little twist of fate, later on, we see this. the armada our queen does love ships now last time we spoke we made a pact. so she never really had to buy ships that were essentially handed to her by the very people she was trying to defeat in the first place and of course during the same sequence we see this what do you want done with them bring her to me so Danny rescues Mary Maz Durr, although she had already been raped several times according to her later, but the point being here that she rescues her and she actually ends up treating Cal Drogo's wound after he ripped Dude's tongue out. <laughs> and of course, Game of Thrones style and an ironic twist of fate later on, we see this. You asked for life. You paid for life. This is not life. When will he be as he was? When the sun rises in the west, sets in the east. When the seas go dry, when the mountains blow in the wind, like leaves. So instead of helping Khal Drogo, she essentially killed Khal Drogo. And of course she did that on purpose and betrayed Danny. And later on, Danny would do this. You will not hear me scream. I will. So 
So indirectly, Miriam Osdur, being the treacherous one who betrayed Danny, actually ended up helping dragons come back to the world. Anyway, guys, that'll do it for this episode. Let me know what you think in the comments below. As usual, thank you for all the support, especially to you guys on Patreon. And a huge shout out to my executive Patreon smokescreen producers, Hall Griffin, Ball Guy 10, Kisa Powell, Marilyn Bentley, Mark Joseph, aka the Snow and Winterfell, Lala Gig, Joanna, Sean Hayes, Anonymous, Linda Stanfield, and Kieran D20. Thank you guys so much. And thank you to everybody out there on YouTube land. Be sure to subscribe to get everything and be sure to click that notification bell so you're notified when I drop a new video. Thanks for watching you guys, and we'll see you next time.